Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Uriel Lopez, and I'm this year's CHCI Child Welfare Graduate Fellow. I am delighted to be with you today for the Building Strong Latino Communities to Support Children and Families in Reduced Family Separation session. This panel is particularly important to me because growing up in California as a first generation Latino in a mixed status family, I relied on a lot of community support systems and social safety nets that really made a difference in my life. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to thank Casey Family Programs for their generous support of this session. The session is fortunate to have two members of Congress serve as session chairs, Congressman Jimmy Panetta and Congresswoman Linda Sanchez. It is now my honor to introduce welcoming remarks from Congressman Jimmy Panetta. Congressman Panetta proudly serves California's 20th Congressional District in the US House of Representatives. During his time in Congress, he has fought for immigration reform the continued protection of our pristine coastline and environment, affordable housing, accessible health care, our agricultural industry, and its for farmers and farm workers, the reduction of gun violence, our military installations that are an integral part in our community, and our country's security and the deserved and promised benefits to our veterans. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Panetta. Thank you, Uriel, and thanks to the CHCI, and thanks to all of you uh, for being here and the panelists, and thank you for this opportunity to say hello. Once again, I'm Jimmy Panetta, and I represent the Central Coast of California. And as a representative from the Central Coast, as someone who grew up on the Central Coast, and as the grandson of immigrants who really is the product of their American dream, I, I, I have experienced firsthand the impact that immigrants can have on a community. From fishing to agriculture to hospitality, immigrants not only defined our economy on the Central Coast, they shaped who we are as a culture and our values on the Central Coast. And therefore, ever since I stepped foot in Congress, I have fought day and night to ensure that immigrants and Latinos communities are protected. Starting with the Dream and Promise Act to make sure that our dreamers and those who are receiving temporary protected status deserve not just to stay here, but deserve doing what they do best here and that's contributing to our communities. We formulated the Farm Workforce the Modernization Act, the most bipartisan immigration reform bill to pass out of the House of Representatives in the past 30 years allowing those who work in agriculture to continue to work in agriculture, protecting their families, and ensuring that they have that opportunity for a pathway to citizenship. And when it comes to farm workers, we on the Central Coast, and we in California, we always knew how essential farm workers are to who we are. It's unfortunate that it took a pandemic to make other people throughout this country realize that. But that being said, that's how we were able to fight for and secure $700 million to protect farm workers from COVID with PPE and vaccine distribution. It's also why myself and Linda Sanchez were able to ensure that that child tax credit through the American Rescue Plan applied to mixed use families. But just because the pandemic is coming to an end does, that mean, does not mean that our fight for Latino families, Latino communities, and Latino immigrants are over. With the leadership of people like Representative Sanchez, with the experts on Latino policy that we have here today, and with the fight of members like me and those on the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, we must continue to work together so that we continue to live up to being a nation of immigrants, a nation of risk takers, and protecting those who took that risk to come here so that they can live that dream to give their children a better life. Yeah. So thank you for being here. Thank you for continuing to talk about that dream and the protections that our Latino communities need as we go forward in this fight together. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much for your remarks, Congressman Panetta. 
Now it is my pleasure to introduce our second session chair, Congresswoman Linda Sanchez. Congresswoman Sanchez represents California's 38th Congressional District, elected to Congress in 2002. Congresswoman Sanchez is the first Latina to serve on the House Committee on Ways and Means and the House Judiciary Committee. Congresswoman Sanchez has devoted her career to helping working people get ahead, advocating for families, improving America's educational system, and bringing jobs to Southern California. Please join me in welcoming Congresswoman Sanchez. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I hope everybody's having a great conference so far. Um, like my colleague, Mr. Panetta, I want to thank everybody for being here today to talk about a topic that is really critical for us to really think about and start moving and taking action on. Um, I want to give a special thank you to CEO and President Marco Davis and the entire CHCI team for inviting me back to the conference um, again this year. Um, the CHCI Leadership Conference is you know, a gathering place for Latinos and Latinas from all over the United States to come and learn and share with each other. So it's an important conference. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, and I'm a representative um, from a district in California, the 38th Congressional District, which is located in Southeast Los Angeles County and has a pretty sizable Latino population. Um, and for me, it really is an honor to be here today to talk about how we can continue to strengthen Latino children and families in our communities and across the country. Um, because there's a lot that we're capable of. We just need to you know, put the pieces together to give people the supports that they need. And I happen to know a little bit about growing up in a big Latino household. Um, both of my parents are immigrants from Mexico, and I'm number six of seven children. So I grew up in a really large family. Uh, my father was an industrial mechanic. And my mom used to clean houses to help supplement his income, and then later went back to night school to get her GED and eventually her bachelor's and her teaching credentials. She became a teacher in her 40s while raising a family of seven kids. That's pretty heroic. Mm -hmm. um, And, you know, they always instilled in us this pride for our heritage. Um, you know, they prioritized hard work, perseverance, uh, you know, respect. Um, and they, you know, my parents sacrificed a lot to give their seven children the, many of the opportunities that they never had. Um, and those are the same values that I try to pass on to my son, and they're not unique. unique. I mean, you look at the Latino community, we're about family, we're about hard work, we're about, you know, getting ahead. Um, and, you know, we have those strong values um, and we have that sense of community that we need to stick together and to help one another. And I think, you know, in my family growing up, those values were even more magnified because my parents wanted us to do well and they expected us to do great things. They wanted us to be successful. Um, and then they wanted us to turn around and help the next people that were struggling. That was like a big component part of their value was, you know, when you've achieved a certain level of success, you have an obligation to your community to turn around and, and help others. Mm -hmm. um, they made sure that all of my brothers and sisters went to college and um, they really pushed on us the idea of taking on new experiences and opportunities that might be outside your comfort zone. Um, and that's why today I want to discuss what our families are and our communities can do to pass those same tools on to the next generation of Latinas and Latinos. And starting with probably the most important thing is we have to keep families together. We saw the devastating impact that the family separation policy of the prior administration um, that was devastating um, to families. And we've made progress to move away from those policies and reunite families, but many undocumented parents still fear, have that fear of their children being taken away from them mm -hmm. when they go to seek services or assistance for their family. We've seen many um, housing and food insecure families afraid to seek available resources because they're afraid that they're gonna be reported as unfit parents. Um, you know, I was blessed to grow up in a two-parent household, and not always harmonious, but um, mm -hmm. it was a lot of support, and a, a, a lot of folks don't have that, and we need to do more to make sure that resources that are needed by families so that they can stay together are there. Um, 
I'm really proud of some of the bipartisan work that we've done uh, in Washington this year, especially on the Ways and Means Committee, and um, Congress Member Panetta has been a great ally there. Um, he understands the issues, and um, specifically our work to promote child welfare. Um, we try to, you know, plus up funding for prevention services and ensure that our foster care system has the tools that it needs. And while there are no shortage of partisan issues, uh, in Washington today, ensuring that children are safe, healthy, and loved uh, shouldn't be something that divides us. Um, you know, especially if you have children of your own, you know how important that is. And that's why we worked with our colleagues across the aisle in the Senate to enact the Family First Prevention Services Act, which enhanced, enhanced support services for families to help children remain at home. And it increased the oversight and requirements for care placements. Um, today, the panel, this distinguished panel, is going to um, discuss what we can do to equip families with the resources and services like housing and food support to prevent children from falling through the cracks and falling into the welfare system. Um, we need to, as I said, start with encouraging family reunification. Um, so you've got an excellent panel of experts who are chomping at the bit to, um, to impart their knowledge and have a great discussion with you. Um, I look forward to hearing from them. And again, I want to thank everybody for coming today and sharing your stories and your experiences with us. Enjoy and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much for your remarks, Congresswoman Sanchez. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Jorge Cabrera. Jorge Cabrera is Managing Director for Casey Family Programs, overseeing Casey's direct practice work in Arizona and California, and has worked at Casey Family Programs for 27 years in various capacities. Prior to his work in Casey, Cabrera worked in Tucson, Arizona as a family therapist with a focus on serving Latino families and children who were involved in the child welfare system. Please help me welcome the panel moderator, Jorge Cabrera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Uriel. Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here this afternoon uh, uh, with you all, uh, and uh, really uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to partner again with uh, the uh, Congressional Hispanic uh, Caucus Institute. Uh, I know we have been here before. We have a, a, a standing partnership that is proven to be uh, pretty fruitful and none more so than now, right? And certainly this panel speaks to the strength of that partnership and the areas that we have in common. Um, just a, a few uh, remarks about what, who we are, Casey Family Programs. We are the, the, the nation's largest operating foundation solely dedicated to improving the foster care system, the child welfare system. Our mission is to provide, improve, and ultimately prevent the need for foster care. And we have uh, anchored, one of the key anchors of our mission is what we call Communities of Hope. And it is uh, really a, um, a pillar that is premised on the, this notion that um, really the, the families are best served by the community, families who are, can be labeled as vulnerable or at risk, can be best served in the community and less so by a system government involvement like child protection that at times proves to be very intrusive. So the more families that we have that, um, that are served in their community that are meeting, having their needs met in their community, the better off that we will be as a society. So that is, uh, that's what Communities of Hope is all about, right? Latino families are a key part of our mission we, we believe that uh, uh, as the demographics of Latinos have significantly increased, right, they have become a key stakeholder for us. Latino families are very strongly anchored in our strategic plan. We have, we have called them out as, a, as a, a group that we need to um, impact in a variety of ways. A couple of examples that I'd like to share with you um, that speak to that is, um, we are undertaking a very ambitious Latinx child and family well-being framework. In fact, two of our panelists today are very actively collaborating with us on the development of that framework. Uh, 
some of you may, uh, may be, uh, it may be coming your way pretty soon. We would like to disseminate it, and CHCI certainly will be a key partner for us as we uh, move towards uh, disseminating this framework, which will be a comprehensive, a comprehensive set of um, uh, products that will help us more uh, broadly understand who these lat Latino families are in this country, Latino families and children, as well as ways in which we can best respond to their needs. So we're very excited about that. The other effort that I'd like to point out very quickly is that we are embarking on a project to support unaccompanied minors. Uh, we are really uh, concerned and are very interested in figuring out community pathways of response for these um, youth when they become members of our communities and reunify with families. Uh, we believe that a more strong, a stronger aftercare, after, uh, uh, after release system needs to be in place. And we are actively embarking on developing that effort. And so, so, and again, we're very excited. And I'd like to, uh, at this moment, um, introduce um, our panelists. Uh, we have uh, a really uh, a great board here of panelists. I'd like to introduce first um, Dr. Rodrigo Dominguez. Um, see if I can find a, <laughs> my notes here. Um, sorry about that. Oh, here is a two-sided. Two <laughs> Dr. Dominguez Villegas. <laughs> Dr. Dominguez Villegas serves as the inaugural director of research at the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Institute. He is responsible for developing, managing, and executing LPPI's research portfolios on economic opportunity, immigrant rights, and democracy and representation. So thank you for being here, Rodrigo. Next, welcome Maria Velasquez. Mm -hmm. My, Ms. Velasquez is the founder and principal consultant for VNN Consulting Services, LLC. She served myriad industries, including child welfare and social services, healthcare, education, nonprofit, and local government. She is passionate about helping organizations implement sustainable processes and practices that meet their intended outcomes and address systemic and individual disproportionalities. Thank you so much, Maria, for being here. And finally, and we are really privileged of having Cristina Romero with us. Cristina, thank you for being here. Cristina, Ms. Romero is a founding member and parent leader of the Family Engagement Advocacy Council. She has lived experience dealing with the child welfare system, some good and some not so good. From that experience, she promised herself that she would do anything to help other families going through similar situations. Thank you for being here, Cristina. Um, I do want to make a quick comment to you and, and invite you all to tweet your comments <laughs> about the session. Thanks, dash CHCI HHM22. I think most of you know that already. I just want to remind you that that is a platform that's available for you to comment. So let's uh, begin the dialogue. I'd like to uh, start by uh, Cristina, start with you. Can you talk from your lived experience? which we are, are, are really um, a value from you today, and, and your current work as a parent leader and your work in family engagement. Can you share with us barriers and challenges that you have seen Latino families face? Yeah, I, I think personal experience and working with the families throughout this conversation, you'll notice in between the panel, we'll have a discussion that will touch a few barriers that I've experienced and witnessed families experience as far as like the language, um, really understanding the Hispanic culture. Um, we're looking at the resources, right? It was stated earlier, you heard that when resources are available, it's fear. Families are in fear of going to get help when it's needed because they don't wanna be viewed in a different lens to potentially put their families at risk of separation. So throughout the conversation, we're gonna engage and use a, a dialogue that we're all gonna you know, share experiences in between data, personal work, my lived experience that will help you um, better understand the Hispanic culture and what we could do to better, better serve our Latino communities. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Sib. I'd like to then, uh, uh, Maria. Can you please uh, share about what you learned about the resilience of community providers? Sure. Well, actually, no. Sorry about that. Here is a question for you, Maria. 
as you've gone around the country, and I think this is part of the work yeah. that you've done on the, on, the, on the framework that we were talking about, you've gone around the country, you've gone to Puerto Rico, listening to family and community voices. What are some of the salient themes that are emerging that require a broader community response on behalf of Latino families? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, everyone. Mucho gusto. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things we need to acknowledge before we talk about the themes is the unprecedented effort of KC Family Programs as a foundation, as a large influencer, to really take the time to understand us before doing, right? That's one. Two, to do nothing about us without us. And so they really mm -hmm. made the point to include those of us who identify as Latinx in the creation of this framework. But I am but one Colombian immigrant of 60 plus million uh, Latinos in the United States, right? And so we needed to make sure we embarked on listening to the familias directly in 13 states across the United States plus Puerto Rico, really on asking them what are the unique needs of your familia and your um, comunidad. One of the things that we did that under, or the framework we did it under, was social determinants of health, right? We've all heard it, but let's debuzz that word for a second, right? The themes that came up are essentially that. They were all determinants of the health and well-being of our children and our families, and not many of them were health-related, right? A lot of them were social uh, determinants of their health. So it should come as no surprise that we found that one, COVID-19 has had severe impact in the well-being of our families, disproportionate impact in the well-being of our families, a lot of whom are frontline workers, right? The second is we know and we heard that mental health services are a priority in the Latinx community and COVID-19 really only exacerbated the need uh, for culturally appropriate um, accessible support. The third theme we heard is that immigration history and migration does impact families differently. However, the immigration status certainly limits the ability for our families to have social and economic mobility. I see all of us nodding. A lot of us identify as Latinx, and we can, we can certainly agree with that. Um, but we also heard a lot of undocumented heads of households and how they are struggling to navigate a complex social safety system and trying to figure out what supports are available for them. And to your point, there is also that additional fear of public charge, right? And uh, tapping into services that might not only hurt their status, but also the status of their family members. We also heard education, right, is a gateway for economic and social mobility in the United States. Parents, as we all probably had those Latino parents, place a high mm -hmm. impact and stress on on going through an education system and succeeding out of an education system. And then we spoke specifically to Puerto Rico and those of us who identify as Puerto Rican know that there are unique challenges for the Puerto Rican community, right? Uh, the impact of colonialism is no stranger to Puerto Rico. Um, lack of access to mainstream uh, or supportive services like healthcare, like childcare. Um, extreme unemployment and uncertainty regarding state government um, and retirement benefits for Puerto Ricans in the island is tough. And then just overall discrimination, right? But I don't want to close the themes without adding the strength-based side of it, which is that we heard resilience, we heard grit, we heard a lot of gratefulness from the Latino community and a lot of hope in times when some of us um, could, be, could be quite distraught. And so it's important for us to highlight not only the challenges that came up, but all of the grit and community that came out of the current time of crisis. Thank you, Maria. Yeah, I noticed that, that you used the word resilience, and I couldn't help to think mm -hmm. about your mm -hmm. remarks, Christina, that mm -hmm. you, the, 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 the amount of the tremendous work that you've done and this giving back, that, uh, that it is a hallmark of the Latino community in many ways, yeah. right, that you exemplify here. And if you want to make some remarks yeah. about that. Yeah, 100%. So I am a certified trainer in Broward County, Florida, for our five protective factors. And um, I incorporate this. We host monthly parent cafes to reach the community for parents who have been impacted by the child welfare system, whether it's their children were separated from them or if they're reunified or even after the reunification process on helping them understand, like if you are Hispanic, you know, we as our, our families are our community. We hold like a village. So we do have concrete supports. We are very resilient and strong. We have family to support us no matter what. Now, these are just things that we are opening the door for others because like myself, I was un unaware what resilience was mm -hmm. until after my involvement with the system. So these are things that folks are doing with their daily lives every day, but they don't know what they're doing. So we open the doors for them 
to help show them that, you know, this is a part of life, this is what you're doing, this is what you have been doing that has benefited your family. You know, whether you're in the system or without the system, um, you know, especially when it comes down to language, it's very hard for organizations to understand the, the barrier between the culture, right? The cultures are different from the American culture. Um, the language, when it's hard for you to communicate with a family if you are not Spanish speaking yourself because then it's hard for them to even understand or how can you relate? So it's putting people in place to where we can relate to one another. We share the same similarities of the experience of what we went through. You know, so it, it opens that door for families to show them there is strength and we do come in numbers, right? Mm -hmm. we, we are a village and not to where a family feels my zip code, my area defines who I am as a person because of a retaliation or a call from a neighbor that is upset. You know, they don't understand the consequences and the doors that are opened once an investigation or a phone call is placed to our child welfare hotline. You know, their CPIs are coming in with the intent to just remove and destroy and traumatize families. And once that process is done and you check off your checklist of what they want you to do and that door is closed, families are still destroyed. And not only that, now they're even more in fear to even go out and get the help when needed, right? Because if I have a food insecurity and I was in the system a few years ago, if I go, are they gonna tell me I'm being neglectful to my children because I have a food insecurity? So we're mistaking child neglect and poverty. They're trying to combine the two and there's a difference. And these small things destroy families. They destroy homes. You know, I sit up here as not only somebody who experienced our child welfare system, but I was a kinship care provider for my nieces and my nephew. You know, and it was hitting, like I, I'm overthinker, right? I always think. So last night I was like, man, you know, I have two nieces that are Mexican. Their dad is Mexican. And my first niece was born, her dad was there. By the time the second one was born, he got deported. These girls never had the opportunity to know their father, so they grew up in a fatherless home, you know, and, and didn't get to enjoy that. The family was separated. You know, we need to do a better job at keeping our families together. We need to invest more into our communities, into our people, because when you do that, I believe communities and families thrive. Thank you, Christina. Yes, I think you pointed a, a, a very key point that, that, uh, that to anchor this conversation, that is that the majority of families that come to the attention of uh, a child abuse hotlines across the country are because of neglect. Mm -hmm. and, 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 but, and that most of the time means that they have lack of access to resource, right? They're living in poverty, right? We know that uh, Latino uh, uh, populations have a high rate of poverty, right, in this country of about uh, close to 50% or so. So that was a mm -hmm. pretty important uh, uh, point that you mentioned there. And mm -hmm. So I'd like to then, on that note, uh, ask Rodrigo to tell us a little bit about your research. Um, and uh, what findings uh, can you share with us that speak to access or lack of by immigrant and mixed status families? Totally. Um, I think the whole panel has said that, you know, when we will have healthy communities when our communities are able to access resources. Before I start talking about the ways in which our communities have been excluded, I want to add a data, po <clears throat> a data point to talk about, to contextualize this idea of neglect, neglect within Latino families, right? Low income Latino fathers and mothers have very high employment rates. 81% of children who live in these families have at least one parent working compared to only 60% of white children or 54% of black uh, children. But what happens is that our Latino community tends to have jobs that require irregular work hours or that requires like two or three or more shifts. And so our parents are working at higher proportions than other groups, um, but the jobs that we have available to our communities and to our, you know, our parents are jobs that are not paying a living wage. And what happens is that people have to get a second or third job or work at hours that are not common. Sometimes in the child protection uh, system, that is seen as neglect when it is not, right? It is necessity. Um, now, talking, to, talking about mixed status families, um, it's important to highlight that 
you know, half of Hispanic children in the U.S. have an immigrant parent, a quarter have an undocumented parent. And there are three ways in which these families have been completely excluded or, you know, excluded in some ways from access to resources that the government provides. <clears throat> the first is the willful exclu and explicit exclusion of either undocumented or uh, mixed status families, like happened with the CARES Act, right, during the pandemic, where in the first round of stimulus checks, the law, right, the law that led, like, the legislators approved in Congress said that mixed status families were not eligible for those uh, $1,400, well, I think the first round maybe had was less than that, uh, of checks for uh, COVID relief, mm -hmm. right? So that's explicit exclusion of our, of our uh, communities. The second way in which we're excluded is through um, bureaucratic hurdles. So when things ha happen, when they're implemented, they're not implemented in ways that our communities can understand. So lack of you know, access to Spanish, for instance, or language access, or a burdensome application process for certain uh, um, government benefits. And the third, which you both alluded to, is uh, what we call the chilling uh, effects, um, which is that because of either fear of repercussions on immigration status for someone in their families, or because of fear of being called into the child protection uh, services, our communities uh, do not seek out resources mm -hmm. that they are eligible for, that they have already paid for with their taxes. and um, so therefore, they're, they're not, you know, they're foregoing a lot of resources that they are, that they could be beneficiaries of. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. So we're going to, uh, in, in a moment, open it up for questions uh, from the audience. But, but so, you know, the, there's, there are some challenges and barriers that you've heard from our panelists, but um, we also want the, also the panelists to talk about Hope, <laughs> communities of hope, you know, that's a, the creation of uh, the different trajectories. And we know that there's a lot that uh, happens already, right, in spite of challenges, because that is uh, that is exactly what we're talking about in terms of uh, resourcefulness, resilience, right? Okay. So, so uh, Cristina, you were talking about protective factors. And, mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, you, it sounds like that's... Uh, um, something you think a lot about uh, and uh, um, and you use it in your work, right? So I think it would be great if you can share with us a little bit about uh, how is that uh, making a difference, making an impact? Well, it's making a difference for the families that we work with and also other community members because we are attempting as parents with that experience to bridge that gap, right? To not have somebody be in fear of looking for a resource or being frowned upon as a parent even, mm -hmm. right? Like you can't provide food this month, how, you know, how dare you? You know, instead of having those feelings, um, we're working on creating a resources, mm -hmm. a resource guide for ourselves to share with our community members and our family to where we are making contact with, um, you know, folks that work in different organizations and agencies that, that are willing to help families and, and not look down on them or frown upon them because, you know, and it's big for me to where if there is a need, I don't want to feel, feel fearful mm -hmm. to go get that need because if I ask for help paying a light bill or if I ask help, you know, for help with food, that I'm going to be under the lens of our child welfare system. I want to be able to know that if these are minor barriers that I have or that other families have, we could help fill that need for them without them feeling the need that if I go in, I'm going to be discriminated against. I, have, I fear for segregation. I fear my family will be separated. You know, those are things that we don't want our community members and our families that we work with to feel. And, you know, as we're all here talking and it plays in my head, right? What can we do? You know, each and every single one of us here today, what can we do internally to where we could share a little bit of our love and our gold and our gifts with the next person that they can share within their organization and agency? Because we need to change the mindsets of, our, of the way we work and the way we think, right? And switch it to where, you know, let me help these families. Let me do whatever it takes to help. And we need to build environments to where families are not afraid to go for resources that they need. Mm -hmm.
because the resources are there and, and you should not be in fear of if you need help with a bill or if you need food or if you need a bus pass for transportation, you know, because you need to get around. And we need those things. We, we are all human. And those are things that will help. So we're trying to bridge that gap to where if you don't want to go to an organization or an agency to have them look down to you, we are parents. We've been there. We've lived that situation. Mm -hmm. So we want to give as much knowledge as we can to the next person to where if you have a friend or family going through it, you could share it, right? These are all things that we could do in our communities as individuals, minus our organizations and agencies. If we could get this to rub off in our organizations and agencies, it would be perfect. Because imagine if everybody was like us and wanting to help and work and support families and strengthen them. Imagine that. We would have thriving communities everywhere you went. Yeah, yeah right. Thank you. So community. Community is, uh, is uh, the key message you bring in. Build community. Community cures. La yes. cultura cura we talk about in the mm -hmm. Latino community. And, and it heals as well, right? So thank you for that. And um, uh, my, Maria, you, uh, 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 when we were talking, uh, preparing for this, you shared some, uh, uh, that you've met some remarkable people yeah. who were uh, doing amazing work in times of crisis, yeah. you know, in times where things are yeah. falling apart, right? Yeah. So, so to speak, so, sure. so if you can share with us. Uh, sure, so. I'm happy to. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is that it's probably no secret to us that if our comunidad is resilient and nimble and flexible, then the community organizations that serve our comunidad, most of the time if they're led by people who look like us, will, be will better serve our, our community and be flexible and nimble in times of crisis. So there were a lot of sort of um, innovative um, practices that we heard and saw from family resource centers and community-based organizations that we should highlight but prior to highlighting that, I do want to add, we were having breakfast this morning with my colleagues, right? And I sat and I kind of remembered, to your point, that I might be sitting here today talking to you about, you know, a landscape analysis of what our familias are in need. But 15 years ago, I was waiting for political asylum, working, selling cars, and cleaning houses until... United States deem me worthy of having a citizenship in this country. And the reason I say that is because it, it, it could be very quickly that we forget where we come from, and it could be very quickly that we forget where our parents and our families come from. And so the one thing I wanna leave with you is as you climb, like Kamala said, right? As you climb, don't forget where we were climbing from and who we're climbing with as we go. Because I can sit here and tell you what the community-based organizations were doing, and I can sit here and tell you all the best practices, which I will happily. But the one thing that sits with me is if I don't continue to bring that part of my story and all that I do, nothing is going to change because the narrative will re remain the same, right? But these community-based organizations who are extremely innovative were um, innovating in times of crisis like COVID-19. So they were embedding coaches in school sites. They were creating professional learning communities and peer support groups for service providers. They were partnering with other organizations to develop a workforce of promotores. They were empowering youth and highlighting the role of youth in advocacy, especially because we know that as youth, we can be bridges for our families. They were hiring more bilingual peer support partners, um, increasing the learning curve for technical support in a time like in times of COVID and therefore increasing the way they can reach their familias. Um, subcontracting with other community-based organizations that serve similar communities to create a wider network. And so there, there is a lot of innovation happening at the community-based organization level, which is to say the groundbreaking work mm -hmm. is actually happening. In order for us to advance it, we need to support, partner with, correctly fund, and elevate the organizations that are doing that work. Yes, so a, an important point you bring is that it is already happening, mm -hmm. right? That, that people are coming together and, and, and creating pathways, right? And what could we see if there were more availability of resources, right. more access right there? So, right. so that's a great uh, segue also yeah. to uh, Rodrigo. And uh, I'm curious, you can speak, uh, Rodrigo, about uh, from the research and policy landscape, what are you seeing that could uh, point to a different mm -hmm. trajectory for families, and particularly for immigrant families? Well, an important message is that um, when equity is taken into account when designing, when writing legislation, and then designing how to implement that legislation, and that is our goal, and when we are at the, at the table, right, as Senator Padilla said in the morning, 
um, then the outcomes will be different. But we have to, first of all, be at the table and then bring that equity lens into the design of legislation and policy because a lot of the, the things that we are able to do or not do are constrained by those like overarching um, laws. So that's um, something that's really important to think about, the, the systemic part of it. Uh, the second thing is about that I want you all to, to think about is um, this idea of resilience. Um, so our communities are incredibly resilient. Our community-based organizations are amazing, mm. are innovative. And we have been you know, building that resilience. But resilience is, um, if we think about it, it is our ability to fight against adversity. Mm. And many times we forget that adversity part. Why is it that our Latino communities are always the most affected by things? Why, like, we need to reduce adversity for our communities mm -hmm. in addition to increase how our capacity to react to it, yes. But we cannot just continue to build that strength mm -hmm. knowing that we're gonna be hit again for in the next crisis, we're gonna be hit again, we're gonna be the community that hurts the most as we have seen with COVID. We need to reduce that adversity part uh, systemically. That, that just put a thought ahead, in my Christina. head as hearing him, right? And we know we are resilient. We know our Hispanic communities are resilient. But why is it that things are happening to where that's it, right? Like you, you have to every day be resilient. Why can we not create something to where a family could just be? And we don't have to worry about are we being resilient today? You know, do I have to be resilient today when I walk out of this door? Like, what am I going to have to face that is going to have to, you know, that I am going to have to turn and be resilient? Mm -hmm. We need to create spaces to where we could just be and live and, you know, enjoy our families and, and, and our communities and, mm -hmm. you know, normally not to where, okay, today I'm getting faced with this obstacle and I need to be resilient today. I need to, to overcome these obstacles, right? I'm just like, you know, as when is it going to be to where we do not have to be resilient? We could mm -hmm. just be human. That's wonderful. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Really I'd like to thank our panelists today. Give us a round of applause for mm -hmm. the <laughs> great remarks. So, so we would like to open it up to any questions uh, you might have. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Alberto Nodal. Um, I'm a bilingual kindergarten teacher in California. And so my question is, how can we get this uh, information into the hands of educators? So first and foremost, we're, we're in the front lines, right? We deal with the families and many times there's a sense of, as you said, fear, but also sometimes embarrassment, but sometimes we're the first ones they come to mm -hmm. and we don't have the answers. Yeah. So for example, at my school, I can't always say, where's the closest food bank? So we, we put them into the hands of the school community liaison but not every district is force, fortunate to have one of those. So how do we get this information into the hands of schools so that educators can get that information to their families to help connect them with this kind of stuff? So I think for me, I, I would answer that for you because I, if you know anybody knows me in my community, I am the go-getter, right? I find out there's a family and they have a need. They're scared to find that resources or go, or go and get it. I'm going to find a place to get it for them. Right. So it could be as small as starting a food drive in your school. Right. Having people donate clothes because half of, half of the time it is, you know, not money, not having enough money for clothes and shoes or food. So those could be things that you start, a, a, you know, an empty closet in your school and you ask folks for donations. Yeah. And then when you see a family has a need, you have it for them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, it, and make it to where they do feel open to come to you because once there's that line of fear, they're not gonna come. Because even with us in, you know, in Florida, with mandated reporting, you know, that comes a lot um, from our educators. So even families are in fear of going to the educators because, you know, it's either healthcare providers or educators that are making, you know, calls for child neglect when it's really poverty. So imagine if you could open the door in your community and you could resolve that just as much as you just going to get donations and diapers and little household items that families do need and, and will benefit them. 
It's something as small as that. I'm, I'm the biggest person. I will volunteer. I will find resources. I will gather food in my house. And when we have parents that are like, man, we don't have food this week. I'm like, boy, I'm coming to see you, mm-hmm. you know? And it's as far as I'm, I'm a firm believer. I think I mentioned it a few times earlier in conversation today. I believe in a trickle down effect, right? My gold, my kindness, what I do will rub off on a few, it may not hit 10, but if I could hit two to three people, now you're carrying that gold and what I have. I just transferred it to you, now you're doing it. Now you're going to another community and you're doing it and then you're doing it and we're spreading our love all over the place, yeah. right? So yeah. imagine it, it starts <clears throat> that small. Yeah, I, I, th- I appreciate the question. I think it's at the micro and macro level, right? I think there are so many Cristinas in so many communities. <laughs> Um, we think there are not, but there really are. I mean, and, and I, I'm a big fan of the Promotores de Salud model, right? The idea that what we do in our Hispanic communities is what we repeat. What we did in Colombia is what we repeat in the neighborhood here. We do. We create communities, uh, resilient communities, where we support each other. So one of the things I, I always encourage at the micro level um, is really identify the Cristinas of your community and back them up and support them so that they can support their community. That's at the micro level because I realize you're also doing a million things directly for your families. I think at the macro level, foundations like Casey Family Program that are building these frameworks to better understand the community, I am grateful to be a part of it, but I was just saying to my colleague the other day, we will have failed if we created a framework that sat in a library book uh, bookshelf and that's mm-hmm. all it did, right? The idea is that at that level, we are creating a framework with recommendations for actual funding to support in the right way and to better understand our community. So I think it's both. It's both at the level of the people building the framework to better understand, but then do, and also at the micro level of finding these amazing promotores and equipping them and supporting them. And if, Thank if you I may add you. something super quickly, adding, uh, adding to that, um, many of you are legislative aides or, mm-hmm. or wanting to go into that career. Many of you are gonna be leaders in government. And so thinking about designing policy mm-hmm. with Cristina yes. and with the community partners, but it's important mm-hmm. to build trust and invest in building the trust with the community, incorporating them in the design of policy, and then not breaking that trust. <laughs> not, not because leaving. that is that those three steps are really crucial. Exactly. So yes. just um, that's, that. exactly. that's co-creating that's with your community, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rodrigo, you have said some things that have just like made my mind go (laughs) crazy. (laughs) Um, But I'm an attorney. I work in Colorado with lots of families. And some of the things I see are at the systemic level, ways we can change the system, either within the courts, um, with awareness, with understanding, with placement of children. I've seen a lot of... um, change in the past few years where I have grandparents and great grandparents asking me to help them get custody of children Mm -hmm. because the parents are um, suffering from the opioid crisis and our system is just not set up for it a whole lot um, to help those individuals and so we have the cultural um, basis there to protect these children and love them and bring them in but then we don't have the system in place to help move them toward that direction and have someone who's their lawful custodian to get them in school, Mm -hmm. to get them the healthcare, to get the food banks and all of the things that need to be done. And so I see this huge need for that. And then for those grandparents who we've been successful with, they need housing because they can't get senior housing once they have children. So then they're on this long line of housing with families and are competing with families who also have the truly big need. So I see those systemic problems um, that I think we really need to address. And I'm just wondering with your research and the policy level, if there are gonna be recommendations or uh, maybe reports that come out to help the local um, governments or courts to to develop that um, systemically. Thank you so much for the question. It's a, great question. Um, it's a really mm-hmm. really good question, really important. Um, so, I mean, the idea is 
that what you mentioned to address, to create policy, to, to study and create policy, we need the expertise mm -hmm. of Cristina and of all the people that you mentioned, right? And so for any uh, policy analysis, policy evaluation, and policy design, um, it shouldn't be just done through having overall data, but through actually going into the communities yeah with the lived experience expertise. That is really the, where the expertise lies. Um, it is in the communities. Um, and so I would say that if there's any policy design, it has to, it has to be that way, done that way. Yeah, yeah I, might, I might add, and in fact, um, I think in the child welfare system and in many systems, we tend to be a little obsessed with evidence-based practices, and it's good. Um, we do need to also highlight a lot of Merge, emer, merging best practice, right? Like promising practice. And so I say all that because everyone needs to look into the Denver Human Services Agency and the work that you guys are doing at Denver. In fact, one of the things that's come out of the Casey Family Program's Latinx Wellbeing Framework is identifying and elevating communities that are doing an innovative approach. And Denver is doing that, right? You're taking a, a unique approach to understanding the needs of the community and piloting different ways in which to work with those abuelas, right? And so I think one is continuing to get behind promising practice and, and supporting promise and practice and piloting promise and practice. And then the other is just trying different approaches because it's not a one size fits all, right? An abuela might need a different type of navigator to be able to keep their family at home that maybe a different parent does not need. And so I think it's being nimble in the way we support our community because it's easy to say we're culturally appropriate. It's more questioned when we are when we have to sit down at the table and be like, okay, esta abuela actually needs something totally different. Are we okay with doing that? So. Hello. Well, thank you everyone for coming over. Um, I am, I'm sorry, nervous a little bit. I am just so glad to be here. And uh, I used to work with DC Catholic Charities. Nice. I worked in pro bono programs uh, at the Charlotte Immigration Court, uh, where it was a group of pro bono volunteer attorneys uh, assisting defendants, actually uh, respondents, I'm sorry, uh, without immigration representation uh, to provide them advice, free advice. Um, my last employment was as a senior paralegal uh, at uh, Jakub Law Offices. Um, but besides that, before that, I worked with the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops in the family reunification program, where I used to do uh, home studies and uh, social casework. Um, you know, I, I know most, I know, and I can relate. Um, I'm in, I am a U.S. citizen, first in the family, uh, born in the U.S., um, so, um, I mean, it's a whole history. I, I reunify my family. I'm still waiting for one sibling to come over to the U.S. So um, I am very, like, motivated in this new bill that it's with Senate. Um, actually, last year, on January 21st, 2021, I submitted a letter to President Biden, and I posted this letter in LinkedIn uh, requesting and proposing this update in the law for the registry of permanent residents, um, which you know I hope that with uh, all the organizations, community, and all the policymakers, um, I just want to see how we can all unite to make this happen because I think really this is the moment. And if there could be a central way online, uh, some kind of database where there could be all these organizations, you know. Uh, by state, uh, somehow, um, all these voting. I I'm not sure what kind of collaboration we can all do, but I, I really think, you know, there's got to be some programs and something we need to do and plan so that hopefully this new bill can pass. Mm. <laughs> if you can please tell me what, what you, you can advise for everyone, yeah, for this new bill or how we can support. <laughs> Thank you. Uh I mean, I would say just how, however your thoughts are right now, right, mm -hmm. to get out in, in the community and, and bring, you know, the people in because um, co-creating and being a part of that when it's to help your community is very important because you can't just look at a community from the outside and be like, okay, this is what you need and not know, right? You need to involve the community in finding out what it needs, mm -hmm. right? Because nine times out of 10, they're going to let you know what is needed in order to help that community. 
So even with those small things, right? Start, start, even if you're starting small, get out there, start small groups. It may not end you with 50 members to 100 members at first, but you'll be surprised to, to have at least five to 10 who are really on the same page and wanting to accomplish the same thing you do, right? And then you look at it going, you know, throughout your state. Then you look at it once you get, you know, set there, look at something that is gonna go nationwide. Start starting those, you know, little groups all over the place, plant that seed all over. And that's when you'll be able to come and create something to where it will be nationally, you know? We have, uh, yeah, thank you. We have time for one more question. Thank you. Hi, uh, Hi. my name is Connie Serrano. Um, just a little background. I grew up here in DC. Um, when I was 17, my dad got deported. And, um, you know, my mom was, became kind of like the pillar of my household. And I think one of the groups that kind of gets forgotten when it comes to family separation is like older, young, younger adults. Mm -hmm. um, I went off to college a year later in Ohio and I, I don't think I really realized how the deportation had affected me until I got there um, and really just used and abused alcohol under the umbrella of like, I'm in college, I'm free, I'm having fun. And so I think in a system where we're already the minority, where mm -hmm. it's really hard for us to find each other in such a large, you know, school or wherever, whatever, um, how can we build, you know, systems in, in the school systems once you're in college that still has the cultura, that still has the comunidad to support young people going through these same things? Because I feel like in high schools and elementary schools, that's, that's already very there, like yeah. at least here in DC, you know, we have the promoteres, we have like the community support workers and it's great, but I feel like in the college system, that's not even, that even being talked about. So I just wanted to ask that. I love that question. I love that question because I, I agree with you. I think when I was in college is when I, it hit me the hardest that, you know, I spent most of my of my high school undocumented. And I think when I got to college, I finally had a green card, right? I could I could travel. <laughs> Went back to Colombia and suddenly I realized, no soy de allá ni soy de acá, right? Like I'm not from there, nor am I from here. And there was this sense of loss of like, I spent so long trying to, you know, get acquainted here and I never fit in. And then I went back and I was like, I'm home. And then like, no, not really, I'm not home. This is, this is different for me. And all that to say it's college can be a very a formative time for us and, there, and it can be uh, lonely and, and isolating. And for many of us, we're not even living on campus or we're working or we're with parents. And so mm -hmm. I can understand that. There are within universities communities. I remember in my university, there was OLA, which is a Latino organization where people came together. I took an unprecedented approach and I highly recommend it which is I found an organization to volunteer for uh, globally, right? It was my chance to travel, but it allowed me to uh, give back to other countries that were different to the one where I was, right? I went to Ecuador, I went to Bolivia, I went to Haiti. We volunteered for children with diabetes. And though I like to think we made a huge difference on children, the difference that they made on me in helping me recognize the network and the, and the cultural um, community I was a part of, um, to this day plays a role in my life. And so, yes, it would be great to connect into these organizations that are like the Latino organizations of college, but if we can also find ways in which we can give back to our community while we're in college, that will give us much more than the latter. And I just wanna to add too, if it's something that you looked around and it's not there, create one. Mm -hmm. You could, there could be other folks that are feeling what you're feeling and, right. you know, wanting that sense of community and family, right? So you can even open the door and, and create, I'm, I'm so big on let's get out there and let's do things different, right? Because the normal way is not working. What has been done for like the past 20 to 40 years, it, apparently it needs a little bit of work. So let's create something mm -hmm. new. Let's try something new. It might mm -hmm. make changes that are necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the good news is that we know more and more what works, right? Mm -hmm. What is what what can work differently than what the true and tried. So we could spend the whole afternoon here talking <laughs> about this and engaging in critical dialogue, but our time is up. So <laughs> Cristina, Maria Rodrigo, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, another warm applause for our <laughs> <Congress. laughs>